And it's so nice to come back to the news. The last time that uh, Secretary Pritzker was at MPW was 2008. It was October. You were on a panel, one month to go, the road to the White House. At that time, as the finance chair for the Obama campaign, you had broken every imaginable fundraising <laughs> record. Secretary Pritzker is an entrepreneur, a civic leader, a philanthropist, the founding partner of uh, Prisker Capital, PSP Capital Partners, and the Prisker Realty Group, and a friend of MPW. We're very glad to Thrilled welcome to you back. Uh, and especially this morning, we have to lead with the news. We're so happy that your department and the rest of the government is open. Can you, can you talk to us a little bit about what this has been like these last few weeks for you at Commerce and generally? Well, let me just start by saying, you know, when I uh, arrived at the Commerce Department, morale had been a little low. We hadn't had a secretary for over a year and uh, the agenda was a little adrift. And so I arrived and I put a sign on my door that said, open for business. And uh, I was in, in, in Asia the last two weeks uh, doing the trip that the president was unable to do. And while I was gone, my staff took the uh, sign and turned it over. So we are back open for business. It is fantastic. And it, I'm just thrilled to have everybody back at work. I had 30,000 of our employees on furlough, and that's just a terrible thing for morale. How do you tell people you're non-essential and then say, okay, you're essential? How does that work? How did you do that? Uh, it's, uh, it's very difficult. And basically what, uh, fortunately, I think our team members understood is this isn't about my decision about them. There's laws and rules, and they, uh, they were very patient with the process. But this is tough. And we've got work to do. You know, I'll get back over there today and, frankly, do what I can to make people feel that you know, they are absolutely essential, because they are. We're all about people. We're in business the same way everyone in this room is. We have customers called the business, uh, Businesses of America, and we have work to do to service them. So we're going to get back at it. Can you um, give us a sense of, of what impact you think this latest budget bonfire has had on the business community and what you're hearing. I know you've been on a listening tour. You've spoken to hundreds of CEOs in the last few months. Um, in particular, about what they're seeing coming out of Washington, what is it that you're hearing from them? Well, I think two things. First of all, the good news is most CEOs are focused on the long term, not the short term. And I think the crisis that we've gone through over the last several weeks is one that really was over that period. But it would be uh, naive to say it hasn't affected certainty, and certainty affects investment, investment affects job creation. And so I think that we have a lot of work to do to make up, to demonstrate that America is open for business and staying open for business, not this is some kind of lurching from crisis to crisis that's the norm for us. Except this deal only buys us till January, so surely we're still lurching from crisis to crisis. Well, I have confidence that uh, given what's happened and given the reaction in America, that both Congress and certainly I know the administration knows it's time to stop all this. And the administration is basically saying, we need a long-term budget. We need to know that we're not gonna uh, play, play with fire over the debt ceiling. And we need to get down to the business of doing uh, the people's business, which is really important. I mean, the president has announced he's going to focus on immigration reform. I didn't meet a business leader around the United States who isn't in favor of immigration reform. The bill in the Senate is a very balanced bill. It's comprehensive. It's something that could really make a big difference uh, for the economy. $1.4 trillion additional uh, economic benefit from the immigration bill. Frankly, we can't afford not to have that. Uh, second, it's absolutely the right thing to do from dealing with, we have 11 million people in this country who uh, we need to offer them a path to citizenship. It has terrific provisions to deal with H-1B visas, additionals, you know, with stapling a green card to your master's or PhD in STEM fields. It's got, you know, it's plus there's uh, uh, a whole effort to work on border control. And so I think that, you know, we're, we're we're going right back to business, and that's what we have to do. Were there other particular priorities that you were hearing business leaders looking to from your department and from this White House? Absolutely. The number one issue I heard from small, medium, and large-sized businesses, and frankly, I was quite interested that it was particularly medium and smaller-sized businesses focused on this trade. 
Give us a free, the free trade agreements that you're working on, TPP, which is in, with Asia, or TTIP, which is with Europe. We want those agreements. We know that 95% of the marketplace is outside the United States. We want to be able to trade with those countries. And the Commerce Department, I'll put in a shameless plug for what we do, but one of the things that we do in our International Trade Administration is we help businesses take your products abroad. We help you find out which markets you're competitive in, and then we introduce you to all the right players in those markets. And that was, it was interesting, that was the number one issue I heard about was trade. The second issue I heard about uh, was skilled labor. We need, what's holding my business back is my ability to find enough skilled labor to fill my vacant positions. And so those are things, I'm working very closely with Secretary Perez on the whole issue of skilling, the skilled workforce. Immigration bill can help with that in the short run, but we need long-term change in that area. I wanna, I wanna come back to the training issue, but I'm interested about your department. So your position was open for more than a year, and before that, President Obama had actually talked about blowing up the department and reinventing it, consolidating all the business and trade related agencies under one sort of secretary of business. Now that never happened. So if you had the magic wand and could reinvent your role, what would you do? What would be different? You know what, the, the, um, the effort to restructure was, was what it was. Unfortunately, Congress didn't give the president uh, uh, restructuring authority. So imagine running your business. You know how you want to restructure it and someone else says, no, I'm sorry, you can't do that. So, but that's that. Frankly, I, the department is, as is, is extraordinary. We do everything from, we give you a patent and a trademark, to we are your national weather service. We, um, we are the census. We do all the data that you use to make business decisions comes out of uh, the Commerce Department. So we're an enormous big data shop. We're, we are in the trade advocacy uh, business. We help businesses trade around the world. We deal with trade barriers. Uh, we also give you a license if you want to sell something that's sensitive to other governments. We, I absolutely am your um, uh, advocate in chief, if you will, commercial advocate in chief with other governments in terms of selling product to other governments. So, you know, we have a very business focused activity as it is. And you know, while the restructuring was a, 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 an objective of the administration and it didn't happen, I'm not really focused on that. I'm focused on what do we do with what we've got. Do you, are you hearing a different attitude about trade, even from traditional free traders, given what we're up against in competition with, with China, with Brazil, with countries that pick state winners and losers, have a different attitude towards trade from their side about rethinking how we, how we think about the WTO, how we think about our trade policy. No, what I'm hearing uniformly from business leaders is get the free trade agreements in place. And frankly, the TPP, which is the Asia Free Trade Agreement that includes both, that includes Mexico and some countries uh, in the Western Hemisphere, is it's 12 countries. It would be 45% of the world's GDP. Imagine having free trade among those countries. It's an extraordinary opportunity for American business. We have a lot of products and services that those countries want. And so the ability to do business with less barriers on a level playing field is an enormous opportunity. And so there's a real push behind trying to get the, you know, the president and our, our US trade rep have set a goal of trying to finish this by the end of the year, meaning an agreement. Then you have to go through the uh, legislative process. So you hear about trade, you hear about training and the workforce. The, since the end of the recession, more than half of the jobs that have been created are, are basically low wage jobs. They earn less than $14 an hour. Do you, what do you see needing to happen in order for more of the jobs that are being created to be ones that are um, that really allow for what we traditionally think of as a, as a middle class lifestyle. Well, I think there's a number of things that could happen, that need to happen. First of all, we need to come up with some solution around infrastructure spending. And I would say that was one of the other major themes I heard on my listening tour. Infrastructure is everything from broadband to bridges. It affects your supply chain of your businesses. 
it affects your commute. It affects the lifestyle of your employees. And we're, we have trilli uh, several trillion dollars of what I call deferred investment, investment that we need to make that we have not made. So that would be an area, you know, and frankly, we've not had success uh, in, in, with Capitol Hill on that subject. So we're trying to look and find out how can we do something more with the private sector. And there's enormous private sector interest by the capital to invest in infrastructure. That would be an enormous job creator, good jobs. Um, the second is we have to continue to invest in R&D. What, what many of you know in your business is most of the R&D you do in your business D, you do the development. The basic research, what I call pre-competitive research, is really funded by the government. And we need to keep doing that to create good, top quality jobs. The third thing is, and you've heard it and you've heard it over and over again here and in other places. We have to continue to encourage young people to go into the field of STEM. There are great jobs, great pay in those jobs. Those jobs are available, so we need to encourage that. But we also need to, um, there are many jobs available today. For example, if you take the smart grid, 50% of the workers on the smart grid are gonna retire over the next five years. Those are $75,000 to $100,000 jobs. Those are good jobs that you, know, you don't need uh, to have a PhD to do that job. So there's a lot of opportunity if we can get people skilled up in the right areas. So you were on the school board in Chicago. Yes, and probably the some... hardest job I've ever had. Why was that? You know, very controversial. Very, you know, it's always very political, very personal, very difficult, emotional. It's an emotional uh, atmosphere within which to try and make decisions. I, well, I raise it because there's some interesting innovations that go directly to this point of IBM partnering with schools on a six-year degree so, yes. that, so that a graduate comes out with an associate's degree with some specific job training. How, how much opportunity do you see in these kind of public-private education training focused partnerships? I think there's an absolutely huge opportunity in America to do this. Uh, Chicago, we did five of these schools. They're called P-TECH schools. I think Motorola did one, IBM did one. Can't remember at this moment the other three. But those are jobs where you come out six years with an associate's degree and you're going to be employed by those companies. This is huge. We need training geared towards jobs, which means the business sector has to get involved. You can't, we can no longer just sit on the sideline. I was 27 years in business, running my business, and I just expected the universities and the community colleges, they'll deliver up, you know, people who are qualified to do the jobs. Right now, we have got to help those institutions focus the training on what we need. I, uh, I wanna throw this open to the audience, but I did wanna ask, as we've been talking all week uh, about women and women's leadership, especially watching how the deal came together, which was fascinating. So, you, uh, I understand, did an Ironman competition in which you finished the marathon even after you sprained your ankle in the first mile, which is insane. Mm -hmm. So, which, which makes me wonder, just how much better, faster, stronger do women have to be in order to? to... I think the women in this room prove the point, right? Every one of us has finished a marathon on a sprained ankle of some sort, right? Uh, I think that all of us have been, to be where everyone is in this room, you've taken risk and you've, you've sort of overcome when you thought you were too exhausted or couldn't do it or uh, the circumstance didn't line up. I mean, when I started in business, uh, and it's sort of hard to believe, you know, there were no senior women in the businesses in my, I joined a family uh, firm and we invested in all kinds, no senior women, not one in the executive dining room, no ability to you know, park in an executive parking space, nothing. And today, you know, what I think is so exciting is we have all these women in this room and what I do know, and I certainly from the Goldman Sachs uh, uh, efforts, many of you are mentors to other women, either your peers, younger women, and how fortunate those folks are because I don't think many of us had those kind of mentors. So I think it's a, you know, it's a great day for women. We saw a great mentoring example yesterday. I think everyone was really moved by what we saw with the high school girls who were here. So that's, it's a great part of the MPW tradition. You're Terrific. Right, who would like to ask a question? I 
can't see very well. So. Look at you. Wow, you're all, you, you haven't the had a second crowd. cup of coffee. All right, well then while you collect your thoughts, let me ask, I wanna go back to the fundraising issue, which I can now ask you about as, as a spectator rather than a central participant. So in 2008, one of the ways I think you were so successful is you were leveraging all these newfangled communications tools like social media and, and you know, but collecting email addresses on handwritten sign-up cards. So, you know, we've seen such a transformation since then. And particularly in 2012, we saw a bunch of billionaires spend a huge amount of money, not necessarily succeeding in getting their candidates elected. I'm curious about what you see as the future of super PACs, what you see happening in this realm, because I think especially having watched what we've watched these last few weeks, we are mindful that the role that money is playing in politics is, is a particularly important one. Well, my personal view about this is, is that I think that the ability for one person to spend millions and millions and millions of dollars to affect our political system is not what democracy needs. And so I personally don't endorse that. And yet that's the law that we have right now. And it is, uh, you know, the 2012 campaign was a very different campaign than 2008 because of it. And, uh, you know, the president was able to succeed in spite of it because frankly, he didn't have that kind of massive, you know, someone writing five, ten million dollar checks on his behalf. I just don't think that's what America uh, is, and democracy, it's, it takes away the voice of every individual, it marginalizes individuals, and I don't think that's good. I think we need the full voice of, uh, of the citizenry. So what has to happen? Well, I, you know, it's a combination of, I think, figuring out the law. I'm not an election uh, expert, but I assume we need changes in laws that will be deemed constitutional. I don't want to ignore anybody, but yes. Hi, Penny. Good morning. It's Catherine Keating from J.P. Morgan. Great uh, to see you. Good morning. Good to see you. Uh, question for you. You talk about uh, being open for business and the business agenda, which I think is very important to all of us, things like immigration and trade. Um, you know, with the debt ceiling debate behind us for a few months, what do you think the outlook is for Congress to be able to start focusing on some of these um, topics like immigration? And what can we do, if anything, to help push that forward? Well, I think there's a lot you can do. I think that uh, Congress will try and focus on immigration reform. It's going, it's going to be put forward. There's a, a lot of support, a lot of bipartisan support for immigration reform. Uh, and I think Congress is going to want to, the leaders are going to want to show that they can uh, function. So I'm an optimist. I believe that this will, I know it's on the administration and the president's agenda. And I believe that we'll get to the business of focusing on that. Uh, the Senate bill is, is a good bill. We need uh, the Speaker to bring a bill to the floor, uh, any bill, so that there can be um, a conference and move forward on immigration reform. What you can do is, if you think that's something you believe in, is make sure your voice is heard. And, and you know, we, we all need to be involved. Yes, this is the last. I have one more question. Hi there, this is Bethany Mayer from HP. Uh, I just have a question um, what your thoughts are about, you know, there's a mandate in Europe around uh, women being on boards there as a percentage. Wondered what your thoughts were about that and if that's something that uh, is being looked at here or not. I don't know of any law requirement by the SEC or other regulatory uh, agencies about requiring it. What we do know is that if a board has uh, several women on it, it the companies statistically perform, I think, something like 25% better than firms that don't have that kind of uh, gender diversity on their board. So to me, I can't imagine if I were running, you know, putting a board together, why I wouldn't want uh, to have gender diversity on my board. First of all, what do we know? Women know how to get things done. Two is we have a great uh, perspective and we know how to compromise. And number three, uh, uh, 
most of us in this room are consumers of one form or fashion, and we're often making the buying decisions. And so why wouldn't you want people who are making the buying decision on your board, helping you figure out your product? So to me, it just makes good business sense. It seems like a perfect place to leave uh, when we are talking about breakthroughs and leadership, so we will be looking for more of those. Thank you, Secretary. Terrific. Chris. Thank you very much.